Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're going to be doing part 28 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights. So we're going to be taking a look at a bunch of different mods people have been making over the past week. It's kind of becoming a weekly thing uh, just because we get that amount of mods released per week to show off. So that's actually working pretty well. So I'm pretty excited to get through. We've got some common animals, we've got some cool animals coming. So we're going to be starting today. We have got the Mallard Duck made by uh, Bongo Hardwood. Let's see if you can get a good look at the mail here. Really wonderful little guy. Looks like a rubber ducky just because it's on the um, flamingo rig. But still really cool. So the mallard or wild duck is considered a dabbing duck, a dabbling duck I mean, that breeds throughout the subtropical uh, Americas, uh, temperate and subtropical Americas, Eurasia and North uh, Africa, but has been introduced to a bunch of countries like Australia and New Zealand. So, these guys belong in the subphalan family, um, and in today, uh, they're considered a waterfowl, uh, because they live in water in there. Not quite foul. <laughs> so the male ducks, which are called drakes, you can see that they've got this really glossy, uh, green head that you can see here that's really quite charismatic. And grey on their wings and belly that you can see. Really quite a charismatic look for them. And the females you can see, let's have a look for a female. The females here, you can see they've got much more of a ground, uh, spectacled look. With this little bit of, with both sexes having this little iridescent blue feather around here that you can see. It gives them a lot of character, so that's pretty cool. So you can see that's what both sexes have. Let's have a look at a male while we're talking about them. So, the mallard gets about 50 to 65 centimeters uh, long, or 20 to 26 inches, with their body making about, about two thirds of that length. The wingspan is about 81 to 98 centimeters, and the bill is uh, about 4.4 to 6.1 centimeters, so that's 32 to 39 inches and 1.7 to 2.4 inches, and is often slightly heavier than most other dabbling ducks, and usually weighs about 0.7 to 1.6 kilograms, or 1.5 to 3.5 pounds. So these guys generally live in wetlands and such, and eat water plants, small animals, and are very social and tend to congregate in large flocks and groups with various sizes, and the, uh, the wild ancestor to domestic ducks. So we have a look at talk about the cute babies here. So let's go through here. Cute little babies. Isn't they cute? So the females usually lay about 13 creamy white eggs to greenish uh, above spotless eggs on alternate days and then incubation for these guys takes about 27 to 28 days and fledging takes about 50 to 60 days for these little guys here which are very cute of course. The ducklings are precocial, that means they are very, very uh, independent when they're born and can are fully capable of swimming as soon as they hatch. So you have precocial and then you have attritial, which is something like a, a songbird, mainly. It's like something like a robin where they are pretty much reliant on their parents the moment they're born until they grow up. But these guys can pretty much go and swim and move on their own. They just follow around mum. So we'll go have a look at another male. So, the mallard duck is considered least concerned, it's a very, very common species, and in a lot of cases it's considered an invasive species, such as uh, Australia and New Zealand, so that's pretty bad. So they're considered invasive there, and they are very adaptable, so they can live pretty much everywhere, even in urban areas where they've been support, uh, supposed to be more localized, and sensitive water species, uh, waterfowl species, so they kind of... Places for species like blue ducks and things like that, native to New Zealand, they kind of displace them. And, um, yeah, that, that pretty much sucks for them, but a lot of, with a lot of habitat destruction and invasive predators and things, these guys pretty much open, it opened the door for the mallards to take in. And they're not mongotry, uh, migratory, and they tend to breed with, uh, genetic, close genetic relatives. So that include things like, uh, grey ducks in New Zealand and other species of ducks in Australia and New Zealand, so that kind of sucks. And that can really affect, that pretty much just pollutes their population, and complete hybridization of these various species of wild duck could result in the extinction of many of the indigenous species because kind of the mallard genes kind of just kind of take over. So there's like a big swarm of hybrids, which kind of sucks. But yeah, so the wild mallard is also the ancestor of modern ducks, uh, most domestic ducks, I mean, 
and it's naturally evolved while gene prune gets genetically polluted by the domestic and feral uh, meadow population. So the feral and the uh, domestic ones often breed with uh, wild ducks and that pollutes their population. So that can suck for them. Still a really, really cool animal though. Really wonderful. So we're going to be moving on from the mallard and we're going to move on to the eastern pygmy marmoset. We're going to move on to here. So we can see here, look at these cuties. Quite a small base for the pygmy marmoset, so that's kind of what you expect, <laughs> wouldn't you? So this is by uh, Ron Moron, I believe the name is. So these are, there's two species of pygmy marmoset, there's the eastern uh, and the western, this one's the eastern, with a few different uh, morphological differences between the two, including like geographical barriers and slightly different colours, which is not too huge, but these guys are a small genus of New World Monkey that lives in the Western Amazon Basin native, uh, in South America. And they're notable for being the smallest primate, in, uh, the smallest monkey and one of the smallest primates in the world at just over 100 grams. And these guys live in evergreen and river edge forests and are a gum feeding specialist or a gum nivore. So they specifically eat gum. And about 83% of pygmy marmoset populations live in stable troops of about 2 to 9 individuals, including a dominant male, a breeding female, and up to 4 successive litters of offspring. The modal size for the standard troop size is about 6 individuals, although most groups consist of family members, some males include 2 additional adult members. So these guys, uh, members will communicate using complex uh, systems of vocal uh, sounds, and chemical and visual signals as well. And the three main calls depend on the distance of the call that they need to travel. These monkeys also may be uh, make visual displays when threatened or to show dominance. So, very visual, very very much display oriented animals. That makes them quite interesting. Also, chemical signaling using secretions from glands on the chest and their genitals uh, allows the female to indicate when she is able to reproduce. And the females actually give birth to twins twice a year, and our parental care is shared between the groups. So you have twins. And the group shares the responsibility of raising the baby, so that's pretty useful. So these guys, as I mentioned, they're not very big, so they only get to about a uh, head body length of about 117 to 152 millimeters, or 4 to 6 inches, with a tail of 172 to 229 millimeters, or 6 to 9 inches. So the average body weight is about over 100 grams. And the females, and the only sexual morphism is the females being slightly heavier. And you can see that they've got this like tawny yellow, uh, orange uh, coloration that they've got going on. That's really, really cool. And they have very much adaptions for arboreal life. You can see they've got the forward facing eyes. And they also are adapted for feeding on gum. So they have incisors that they can use to gouge trees to drink that um, gum out of the tree. So that's pretty cool. And they walk on all four limbs and they can leap up to five meters in the branches. So as I mentioned, these guys are found in western the Amazon basin, so Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. Uh, the western marmoset, uh, that's the eastern marmoset, is found in the Amazons, uh, Brazil, eastern Peru, and southern Colombia, while the eastern is found in the Amazonians, but in Brazil, eastern Peru, and northern Bolivia. So the two different species. And as I mentioned, these guys specialize feeding on gum, so they gnaw holes in these uh, trees and suck up the gum, kind of like vampires, uh, tree vampires, I think that's a good way to put it. <laughs> and I was already talking about the social structure. And these guys are threatened by habitat loss, also uh, the pet trade, because they are very cute. And they are co common-ish kept as pets, they can range for about $10,000 to $4,000 and can live for 15 to 20 years. And, and even though another expense of these pets is that they need to necessary because they are gum feeders, but they can be fed insects, uh, fruits, uh, in, in spoiled lizards in captivity, and they're quite hard to keep in those as pets. But that's also an issue because they're taken from the wild. They need to make sure they be captive bred to be pets, and they usually are kept in zoos. And since they're very cute and they're very non-aggressive, often kept in zoos and things like that, so they're pretty docile, and obviously in the pet trade. Luckily, not too endangered. They are considered vulnerable, depends on the species. So the Eastern Pygmy Marmoset is considered vulnerable. So there are risks, but there's lots of population, still lots of them around. Just need to make sure that they're properly conserved. Really cool bunch of animals. How can you not love them? Cute little marmosets. Okay, so now we're going to be moving on from a mammal back to a bird. 
So that was done by Ron Moron, the Black Swan. This one was done by Narwhaler, who did the other two swans. We've got the Black Swan. A really cool swan, I love these guys. So the Black Swan is a very large water bird and a species of swan that is found in the southeast and southwest regions of Australia and New Zealand. And while Australia, these guys are nomadic and they will migrate during uh, different climatic conditions. They will migrate different places. And you can see they're quite a large bird and they have this very charismatic uh, black plumage with this contrasting red belt, which always goes well together. They, it is monogamous breeder, so with both parents sharing and uh, incubating the crunching, the little baby. Got to take the little babies here, so they both incubate them. So these guys also get pretty big. They can measure up to about 110 to 142 centimeters or 43 to 56 inches in length. And they weigh between 3.7 and 9 kilograms or 82 to 19 pounds. 8.2 to 19 pounds. The wingspan is generally between 1.6 and 2 meters. So 5, to, uh, 5 foot 2 to 6 foot 6. And the neck is pretty long and they have this really long S shape. And that's really charismatic these guys. They've got a pretty long neck even for other swans. So these guys, as I mentioned, they're found across southwest of the eastern Australia and adjacent coastal islands. They're found in Tasmania, also New Zealand, things like that. And they tend to have it around fresh water, brackish and saltwater lakes, swamps, and pretty much any water. And they also favour permanent wetlands, including ornamental lakes. They'd also be found in flooded pastures and tidal mudflaps, and occasionally on the open sea near islands of the shore. So you can see New Zealand has an introduced population. There was a relative to these guys that used to live in New Zealand, but um, they were pretty much hunted to extinction. And in 1864, the Australian black swan was introduced to New Zealand as an ornamental waterfowl. And has been found in places like um, Rotorua, uh, the Chatham Islands, Lake Ellesmere, places like that. Black swans have also been known to naturally flow into New Zealand, leading scientists to consider them more native than exotic. Although the present population is from descendants of deliberate introductions, so it's kind of a grey area. They've also been introduced into the United Kingdom. They're a popular ornamental bird as well. And escapees are commonly reported. But at this point, there's not really a self-sustaining population. There is a couple small populations, but nothing too big. Uh, also, Japan, in the United States, there are a couple breeding populations, but there's not really sightings. And reported in Florida. Of course, everything invasive in America is in Florida. <laughs> and China. So these guys are it's pretty much herbivores, and they feed on like uh, reed mace and pretty much whatever they can. And they are largely monogamous, so let's let's talk about the babies now. So they are largely monogamous, and they pair for life with about a 6% divorce rate. Better than the 50% divorce rate in people. <laughs> so recent studies have also shown that a third of all broods exhibit extra pair parenting. So an, an estimated one quarter of all pairings are homosexuals, actually. So it's mostly between males, so gay males will take care of the babies as well, so that's pretty cool. And they'll steal nests and form temporary threesomes with females to obtain eggs, and uh, driving away the female after she laid the eggs. So they're not very polite to the donors. So they usually uh, breed in the southern hemisphere in the winter months, so winter, winter months, so February to September, occasionally in large colonies. And they build these big nests and rats of reeds that can be one and a half meters in diameter and up to a meter high. In shallow water or on islands. They typically lay about four to eight greenish white eggs, they incubate for 35 to 40 days, and you get this pretty cute baby that comes out. And after hatching, they'll be tended by their parents for about nine months until they fledge. So it's pretty cute. So I mentioned these guys are luckily listed least concerned, so there's not much going on with them, and they've considered kind of a part of Australian culture, uh, kind of a concept of uh, virility and culture, and they're found on the coat of arms as well. So it's a pretty cool animal. Really wonderful swan. Great boys. So that was done by Narwhala. Now we've got a return from last week. If you'll remember last week we had the Asian small called Arta Orta, but now we have it again. So I won't talk about this guy too much because you can just watch that video of course, but we've got this really cool model from uh, Leaf and Bubbly Ones, Gen Bubbly Ones, who makes like some of the best Planet Zoo uh, mods. We can see this uh, Agent Small Claude Otter that we can see here. So this is a really nice model. So as I mentioned last week, uh, these guys are also known as the Oriental Small Claude Otter or the Small Claude Otter. And they quite uh, get that name because they have short claws that do not extend past the webs of their feet and can generally get to a body length of about 730 to 960 centimeters or I mean millimeters or between 28 and 37 inches. 
So these guys live across uh, Southeast Asia and they feed on lots of small invertebrates and things. They can be found in places like Java, Sumatra, Paldwan, found in wetlands, West Java, places like that. And these guys are mostly active after dark and they live in groups of up to about 50 individuals and there have been groups of up to 53 reported and they like to swim. They kind of swim with like a really unique uh, swimming pattern. Let's see if you can spot one swimming. They kind of swim with their back legs. They kick and do it like that. Really wonderful. And these guys mainly feed on crabs, mud skippers and types of fish. Size of the crabs that we need to that known to eat is about 10 to 44 centimeters. And captive uh, small clawed otters have been observed to leave sun, a shellfish in the sun where the heat causes them to open and then they can consume them without crushing the shells. So, also as I mentioned last week, these guys are threatened by uh, poaching for their fur, also destruction of their habitat such as hill streams, peat swamps and mangroves uh, for agriculture, agriculture proce uh, projects. Also, um, water pollution through pesticides, overfishing, tea and coffee plantations, and also very much sought after the illegal pit trade uh, because these guys have been offered for sale and things like that. And they don't really make the best pets, so don't get it, otter. But luckily, they are quite common in captivity. They are managed and are pretty popular in zoos because they are very cute and very interactable. Really cool little animal. So yeah, we're going to be moving on from this wonderful model after a little bit. We're going to have a look. We'd we'll see if we can find the baby. So there was a baby that we had. I want to show off the baby. Where is the baby? There's an adult. Adult. There was a baby. They had a baby. Must have grown up. That's alright. But we will move on anyway. Ooh. Although I saw something there. Anyway, let's move on. From. Seth again, who I got his name wrong last time, he also made the, uh, last time, we are going to be moving on to the Humboldt Penguin. So we're going to be having a look at that by Seth. Where is that? Let's have a look at you, look at you, wonderfuls. Wonderful penguin. So, the Humboldt Penguin is a South American penguin living mainly in the north of Chile, around most of coastal Peru. They are the closest relative of the African penguin, the Galapagos penguin, and the Melagelic penguin. And the Humboldt penguin in the cold water current it swims is both named after the explorer Alexander Vos Humboldt. And they're listed as vulnerable by the IUCN with no re uh, population recovery plan in place. So they are considered vulnerable just because of much of different uh, issues, but they seem to be doing okay. The current population is con uh, composed of about 32,000 mature individuals and is going down, so that's kind of concerning, and they consider migrant species. So Humboldt penguins are generally considered medium-sized penguins. They go from uh, 56 to 70 centimeters long, or 20, 22 to 28 inches, and a weight of about 3.6 to 5.9 kilograms, or 8 to 13 pounds. You can see here they have this very charismatic black head with a white border from their eyes that you can see along with uh, black eye coverts and down the chin. You can see it's very charismatic, the Humboldt penguins. They also have blackish gray underparts and whitish underparts with the black breast that extends down, uh, black breasted band that extends down the flanks that you can see here. And yeah, just generally look cool. And they also have this fleshy plinked part of their bill here that you can see that they showed off in the Humboldt penguin. Really cute animal, but still really cool. So. Like other penguins, these guys generally eat a lot of small fish, uh, invertebrates and things. And they will reproduce, uh, they lay about two eggs uh, at the same time, at the same day, four days apart, and require 41 days of incubation, where they nest in these big loose colonies, like other penguins. They lay their eggs from March to December, and but they'll also peak within April, August, September, due to individuals having a second clutch. Half the females actually have two clutches a year and most were double brooders, so they seem to be doing well at least, so they tend to breed brood twice a year. The incubation itself shifts on average two and a half days between one parent allows the other to forage, and chicks generally house uh, generally two days apart, and they're semi artificial that means they can kind of swim and move around, but not quite yet, but they still require their parents to feed them. It's pretty cool. And, uh... These guys also are sedentary during the breeding season, even though they can cover large distances. And they are true migrants, so they migrate from Peru to Chile, probably finding the seasons and the food. 
And they are considered vulnerable with, as I mentioned, there's 32,000 mature individuals, but it is going down, so that could be at risk. Let's have a look at the baby while we're talking about him. So yeah, cute little baby. So a lot of the issues that these guys face is the El Nino or La Nina, where it can change the surface temperatures that can affect like mass mortality, especially in juveniles, nest certification. So upwelling of those nutrient rich bottom waters is depressed. So that's kind of when they breed all the healthy, uh, full of life water is kind of uh, depressed, just depending on the time of year that can affect the survival of their babies and even the adults yeah. themselves. Fisheries as well, um, they can take uh, a lot of food that could be going into the mouths of the penguin that's going to us. Human presence as well, very sensitive. So often if you get too close to stresses and stuff, they can leave their nests and decrease their reproductive success if there's too many people around. Also feral species an issue, such as in central Chile, noir rats, rabbits, uh, feral cats and dogs also will consume penguins, so that's also a big issue. And industrial development, so a lot of these uh, coal plants are well, and things like mining and stuff can really affect the habitat where they like to live. And that's bad. And they're also quite heavily um, exploited for guano, so the guano would be used as fuel. And that's kind of like taken off. Uh, it's a rich fertilizer and a source of income for the government. And then it was sought after, which killed, caused them to kill the penguins. That means the penguins can't consume guano anymore, can't make guano and then kind of the market crashed and also some really bad El Ninos affected the population but luckily they are conserved, they're considered illegal to trade and especially in their places and they're illegal to hunt, possess, capture or transport without a, without a permit from the government commercial purposes and luckily they are they are well protected so that's pretty good really wonderful animal Really wonderful. So now we're going to move on from Humboldt penguins to rhinos. This one was done by Narwhaler again. We've got the Javan rhinoceros, and I gotta say, I love Javan rhinos. Here's a look. Where's the, where's the male? The male's the biggest, baddest one. Let me look at the male. And there he is. So this is the Javan rhino. Let's get a look here. Wonderful big guy. So the Javan rhino is a very tragic story. They're also known as the Sunda rhino or the lesser one-horned rhino as they are closely related to the white rhino, not white rhino, the uh, um, Indian rhino. They're a very rare member of uh, the rhinos. They have the same genus of the Indian rhino and a similar mosaic uh, armor-like skin as you can see here. And they can get um, about 3.1 to 3.2 meters long, so about 10 feet in length and for 1.4 to 1.7 uh, meters in height, so about 4 foot to 6 to 5 foot 6 and a smaller, uh, closer in size to the black rhino rather than and their horns are usually pretty short, you can see it's no usually gets no longer than 25 centimeters and smaller those of other rhino species only adult males have horns and the females lack them so they used to be one of the most widespread of the Asian rhinos they used to range from the islands of Java and Sumatra uh, throughout Southeast Asia and into India and China, so very wide-ranging species, probably the widest ranging of all the uh, Asian rhinos. But very sadly, they are critically endangered now. They are probably the la rarest large mammal on Earth, which very sucks, very much sucks. And they have a population of approximately 74, but luckily it is growing. We have a couple calves that have been born in the Ognungkalong National Park on the western tips of Java and Indonesia. So the largest uh, mainland rhino, uh, Javan rhino, was killed in 2009, I believe, and was declared locally extinct in Vietnam in 2011. So the decline of this is pretty much exclusively due to poaching, because a lot of Chinese markets really want the, bla uh, the horn of these rhinos because they believe it has medicinal properties, when it really does not, and it's the most infuriating thing. And some of these can get very, very uh, high, high fetching prices. They can fetch for about 30,000 US dollars per kilo on the market. So it can make a lot of money from rhino horn. And as European presence in their range increased, trophy hunting also became a serious threat as well. Loss of habitat as well from the Vietnam War, things like that, and has really uh, ended, caused their decline and unable to recover. So they only live in that one national protected area and are still at risk from poachers disease and a loss of genetic diversity, which happens in a lot of small populations 
So it's really cool to have some really nice uh, conservation programs put in place for these species. Really cool animals. So Javan rhinos can live for about 30 to 45 years in the wild. They live in typically lowland rainforests, wet grasslands and large floodplains. They are mostly solitary except for courtship and off uh, spring rearing. And though groups may occur uh, as they congregate during waterholes and salt licks, um, also wallows. Aside for humans, they have no uh, predators in their range. And they usually avoid humans. And scientists and conservationists really study the animal due to the extreme rarity and the danger of interfering with such an endangered species. Which kind of sucks because you could probably have some pretty good conservation programs to help these animals. So they are really wonderful. Researchers rely only on camera traps and fecal samples to gauge health and behavior. Consequently, the Javan rhino is the less studied of all the rhinos. Two adult rhinos with their calves were filmed on a, on a mo uh, motion-triggered video released in 2011 and believe they're still breeding in the wild. And there have been a lot of different populations, uh, even recently as 2021. We've had a couple baby rhinos born, so it seems that they are increasing and doing well where they live. So that's a good sign. And we'll be talking about the babies. We'll have a look at these cute little babies. So cute. We need more of these little baby rhinos. <laughs> So, in April 2012, they released videos showing 35 individual rhinos, including mother offspring and courting adults, and it's believed to be only 58 to 68 left in the wild at the time, and none are in captivity after the death of a male rhino named Samson, who died in 2018 after 30 years. He usually lives 50, 60 years, and DNA conducted that his cause of death was probably by inbreeding depression. But, these guys are, again... Breeding. There have been lots of recent camber traps showing that they are breeding, so it'd be really cool to expand it in the future. Maybe find other popular places where you could put safe uh, populations of these animals, things like that. So I really hope some good conservation work gets put forth for these guys because they're so cool. Javan rhinos are one of my favorites. Just such a cool, unique animal. But anyway, we are going to move on to another cool animal. We're going to be moving on from the German rhinoceros. By this was made by Havoc1199, the Uzari brown bear, bear. So, this is a subspecies of brown bear, of course. Uh, they are considerable in size to things like Kodiak bears, and they're not the same subspecies. And they can get pretty big. Adult uh, skulls have been measured about 38 centimeters long and 20, 33 centimeters wide. So they're very, comp they're only really slightly smaller than the largest Kodiak bears, since they're considered an island population. So these guys are found in, um, ho uh, ho how do you pronounce it? Uh, basically, you were found in the Yusori Kari, uh, a lot of these places, northeastern China, the Korean Peninsula. Hakidawa, I believe how you pronounce it. I'm not Japanese. Don't don't lynch my mobby in the comments, please. And uh, and cons until the 13th century, they have uh, pretty much lived in Honshu and places like that, and have uh, probably driven to extinction in some places by uh, Asian brown bears. This was seems to be three genetic genetic groups, uh, distant for at least three million years, which reached uh, Honshu and. Hokido, I believe how it's pronounced it. But these guys are pretty, pretty big. These guys also are occasionally preyed upon by Siberian tigers as well, and consider 1% of their diet, along with Asian black bears made in about 18% of their diets of the Siberian tigers. So these guys are prey for tigers, and a really cool bunch. These guys live in Russia as well. A really cool bunch of animals. So... These guys pretty much are not too dissimilar. They're mainly vegetarian and being the largest predator uh, of being able to kill it. And these guys live in burrows and things are similar to... Uh, they're also uh, kind of c compete with and uh, can be up-competed by bra black bears. So it's pretty cool guys. Um, they feed on usually like bilberries, ants, just really whenever they can. They are feeding on diet and... Uh, small mammals, larger mammals, fish, birds, and insects. And recent uh, increase in size, they can reach about 400 to 450, reaching 400 or possibly up to 450 to 550 kilograms. So they can get up to a little over 1,200 pounds because they feed on crops. And there's lots of regional subpopulations that you can see in Japan and also um, the Far East and the Korean Peninsula. So really interesting. There's populations about... Um, a few thousand, I believe, uh, can be high is about um, 
10,000 or so. And they have been about 141 uh, deaths from uh, the first 57 years of the 20th century. About 141 people died from bear attacks. Another 300 were injured. And yeah, these guys are not in danger really because they are doing a well, well in the places where they live. Especially, uh, and they get preyed upon by tigers. So that's a really cool fact about them. I just love these guys. And look at these cute little babies. Oh, they're playing. It's weird to think that bear, brown bears are preyed upon by tigers. I think that's really weird. So now we're moving on from the Zari Blam Bear. Now we have got... This one was done by Leaf. I'm really excited to show this one off. We have got the Sloth Bear. Really wonderful, really wonderful animal. So the Sloth Bear is called... Um, it's a Microcopophagus, which means that it eats ants and insects they're native to the indian subcontinent and they but they also feed on fruits uh, ants and termites that's what they usually feed on they're considered vulnerable by the iucn mainly by habitat loss and destruction so these guys uh, may have reached their current form about the early pleistocene that's what they kind of look and they are a medium-sized bear they can range from about 55 to 105 kilos or 121 to 231 pounds and typically sized females range from about 80 to 145 kilos with exceptional large females reaching about 124 and exceptional males about 192 kilograms about 423 pounds and the average weight for the sub uh, nominate subspecies in the poll is about 95 and uh, for females and 114 for males so that get quite big and you see they have also got these quite thick and long muzzles that you can see here really like uh, round faces and they got really long fur that the babies we use to climb on almost like giant anteaters so the babies will climb on them it's just really really cool and it's usually completely back except for a white part on their chest or on their muzzle and they have uh big t the longest tail of actually any bear that grows up to 18 centimeters that's pretty cool so these guys are found usually in india or nepal uh temperate climate zones of bhutan and sri lanka and they tend to live in a range of habitats such as moist and dry tropical forests grasslands uh, scrublands and savannas and they are originally extinct in Bangladesh which sucks. So these guys uh, may travel in pairs and males often observed being gentle with cubs they may fight for food and they kind of walk around with a slow matter and they will maintain territories and such so not too different from other bears mainly what they eat and they're pretty good swimmers as well so the breeding season as well for these guys varies uh, in India it can be April, May, June and they give birth in December, early January and in Sri Lanka it can occur all year round. So the sows will gestate for about 210 days and give birth to the uh, uh, cubs in shelters or caves and litters usually consist of one to two, maybe three cubs and they're born blind and open their eyes up to four weeks. Uh, sloth bear cubs develop quickly compared to most other bears. They start walking a month after they are born uh, and they become independent 24 to 36 months uh, after they are uh, born and become sexually mature at three years old. Young cubs will often hang out and then ride their mother's back, so that's why they've got the long hair as well. So that's really, really cool. And uh, individual uh, riding postures are maintained by cub through fighting, so they can pretty much just hold on while they fight. And it's really cute to watch. These guys are expert hunters of termites and ants, where they locate by smell. Kind of like go around smelling them, they scrape it and lick it up with their... Uh, their tongues and they also supplement their diet with fruit uh, plant matter carrion and often other mammals as well but very rarely they eat things like uh, mango sugarcane jackfruit uh, wood apples honeycomb as well they'll eat things like that and uh, really soft bears have been found to be addicted to sweets in hotels where they visit the rubbish bins so they will go <laughs> and raid rubbish bins like I think that's really funny and these guys Often are preyed upon by sloth bears and leopards can be a threat to these guys as well. Same as doll packs and golden jackals. And also uh, live in uh, with other bears such as the Asiatic black bears and also sun bears which coexist. So really cool guys that can all live together. And they do not, Asian elephants do not tolerate sloth bears. So they don't like them for some reason. Probably because it uh, hurts their calves. And also... Uh, Indian rhinos as well don't like these guys, and they will both charge at them if they see one. So sadly, their estimates have been about lower than 20,000 uh, sloth bears in the wild in India and Sri Lanka. 
So they are protected. I believe they are considered uh, endangered or vulnerable. Vulnerable, yep. Considered vulnerable. And other risks include human bear conflict. Same with like elephants and rhinos. Also, uh, bear bile is a big thing. And just a lot of issues around that. Garbage as well. There's lots of human bear conflict. Uh, degradating habitat and also bear bile they, they're one of the species that can be effect, affected by bear bile since they are uh, farmed for it which sucks and they're considered one of the most aggressive bears believe it or not you may think they're hanging around almost like a panda but they are very aggressive and due to the large human populations often in where the areas where they live there are often attacks and there have been i believe a uh, few hundred attacks uh, lots of attacks i don't have a number here but lots of attacks and they also have been sometimes hunted by uh, people hunt them and very resilient to body shots. And we'll have a look at these cute babies while we're talking about them. So they used to be hunted, but now they're considered endangered, so they are protected or vulnerable. And a very common um, kind of shown off as Baloo in the Jungle Book, even though in the movies he's kind of considered like a brown bear. In the book he was originally a sloth bear. So he taught uh, Mowgli the bear necessities, the simple uh, bear necessities. Yeah, so that's a really cute baby, wouldn't you agree? Adorable. So now we're going to be moving on. So that was by Leaf. Now the next one is also by Leaf, but also is a model made by Zoo Tycoon 2 for Aurora Designs. We have got the West Indian Manatee. So we can have a look at these wonderful guys. Look at you, aren't you wonderful? <laughs> wonderful manatee so also known as sea cows they're the largest surviving member of the order serenia so this includes dugons and the extinct stellar sea cow and they're split to sub two subspecies the florida manatee and the caribbean manatee and these guys are obligate herbivores so that means they developed a bunch of ways to uh, communicate communicate with their voices and they have these very highly sensitive Risperlay that you can see on their mouth uh, here, or pretty much they are considered pretty much um, what do you call it? Uh, whiskers, yeah. And they use them for feeding and navigation. So these guys can get pretty, pretty huge and live very, very long. So the average West Indian manatee is between 2.7 and 3.5 meters long, or between 8.9 and 11.5 feet, and weigh between 200 and 600 kilograms, or 440 uh, pounds to 1,320 pounds with females generally larger than males. The largest recorded individual was 1,755 kilos and was measured to be 4.6 meters long, so it's pretty big. And manatees are estimated to live 50 years or more in the wild. And there was one captive manatee named uh, Snooty who lived for nearly 70 years. She lived to be 69. So very, very long lived animals. And if you guys don't know, these guys are they were very closely related to elephants. And these guys, uh, are considered Afrotheres. So Afrotheres are a group of mammals that include uh, manatees, dugongs, elephants, hyraxes, elephant shrews, tenrex, that are both, uh, they're all very differently looking animals, which is really, really weird, but they all uh, come from the same group of animals and it's kind of spread across Africa and then to the world with uh, these guys and just really very distant and uh, diverse group of animals. So, these guys also have a prehensile snout, like a relative the elephant, that they use to grasp and move around uh, objects and also food in their mouths. So these guys are found mostly in shallow coastal areas, including rivers and estuaries, where they will find their food. And they also usually hang out in waters that are approximately 20 degrees, uh, below about 20 degrees, that can be dangerous to them, so they tend to hang out in water that is warmer than that, so they tend to hang out in Florida, uh, places like that. And they have no natural predators and they have no predator avoidance behaviors and their large size and low metabolic rates leads them to the capacity to having deep dives as well as being slow and they're frequently solitary but they can hang out together and they make lots of really cute sounds like whistling and stuff like that to communicate with others and they're obligate herbivores and known to feed on about 60 species of aquatic plants including seagrass uh, also they will climb up like half climb up onto land and uh, feed on normal grass, which is really weird and they have the uh, non-ruminant and they have a very big hind gut Which is like a really huge part of their body and that's kind of helps them float as well and they have a and 
They're very slow breeders. Uh, they can reach maturity in about three to four years for males, while females reach maturity in about three to five years. They breed throughout their adult life, although most females breed first at the, at the age of seven to nine. And the gestation of this period, uh, period for these guys lasts about 12 to 14 months, where they give birth to a calf and can often be twins. Where the calf is born, they usually weigh between 60 to 70 kilos. Uh, pounds, I mean. Where are you? I want to show you the babies. Look at the babies. And manatees do not form permanent pair bonds, and the male provides no parental care, and the baby takes about two years to wean. A single female reproduces in about two to three years, and wild manatees have been documented producing last until late 30s, and a female manatee in captivity gave birth in her 40s. So that's long breeding. So these guys are considered, they were recently just taken off the endangered species list, but sadly 2021 has had the highest manatee uh, uh, casualty rates with about, I think about 800 manatees dying this year, which sucks. These guys are very susceptible to obviously climate change. Also, um, another big issue for these guys is uh, collisions in boats because the propellers can cut them up and that can cause very serious injuries, which sucks for them. But they're still really, really cool, so that's why they are considered endangered. Uh, but they are considered vulnerable overall. And it's still a wonderful animal. I want to see more of you swimming. This one's swimming. I love manatees. Really hope to see do. I, you know what mods we need to see? We need to get a stellar sea cow and a dugong. That should be coming, hopefully. I'd love that. So I believe this would be a good place to end the video. So, yeah. I really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to click that little bell icon to get notified when I upload anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Guys, like and subscribe, and bye bye.